Hi, good, good morning. Uh, tomorrow, most of you know, the Venezuelan people will vote. And I arrived back from South Africa and looked at the New York Times, which had a terrible headline. Uh, the headline said that uh, this is an opportunity to get rid of a dictator. Now, this struck me as interesting because, as far as I know, Nicolas Maduro won an election in 2013, which was ratified by external observers and, you know, a whole slew of people. And indeed, having won an election, Nicolas Maduro, therefore, is not a dictator, but a legitimate president of Venezuela. So here you have your newspaper, the New York Times, delegitimizing, delegitimizing a head of government routinely in its headline, front page, above the fold. We are in a battle of ideas. That's what we're in. And we're losing this battle of ideas. We're not aggressive enough in putting forward our narrative. We're too scared of being called something or the other, you know, Assadists, for instance, tankies. You know, I was born after 1956, and I've traveled to Syria perhaps, I don't know, 20 times since that war began. And every time I write about Syria, somebody on the internet has a flame out war calling me a tanky because I have a certain opinion about what's happening in Syria. Tanky. This refers to the Soviet invasion of Hungary in 1956. Again, 11 years before I was born. I've been to Syria. I've reported from Syria. People who have no idea where Syria is presume to argue against you in a battle of ideas where they are basically repeating the US State Department's talking points. This is the battle of ideas. I want to just spend a few minutes talking about the two vectors in this battle of ideas, which I think are the most important for our time. The first is the concept of wealth, and the second is the concept of peace. Let's think about wealth for a minute. I mean, in this society, it has become perfectly natural for entrepreneurs to put themselves forward as heroes. Perfectly natural. Perfectly natural for people to genuflect when an entrepreneur donates money to a good cause. Donates money, it's not their money. You see, we have given up the idea that wealth is produced by workers. And it is this socially produced wealth which is privately appropriated by capitalists who then masquerade as if this is their wealth for them to decide to give away and not to pay taxes on. See, we have basically accepted the view, we've accepted the view that the rich don't have to pay taxes. It's perfectly reasonable because after all, the rich create jobs with their wealth. This is not socially produced wealth, it's privately produced wealth. In accepting terms like create, they create jobs. We've basically surrendered the battle of ideas to them. They have won. By accepting the view that the rich deserve their wealth, we have allowed ourselves to surrender in the battle of ideas. It is not the rich that produce wealth. It is workers that socially produce wealth which is privately appropriated. Therefore, workers deserve social goods. You know, it's extraordinary that we have to make an argument for something like public transport. It's extraordinary. You don't have to argue for public transport. It's a right. You don't have to argue for public schools. It's a right. You don't have to argue for public space. It's a right. And it's just this. It's on just this point that we've basically surrendered everything. We've accepted the view that the rich deserve their wealth. They do not deserve their wealth. They do not absolutely deserve their wealth. And we should stop behaving as if we are grateful when entrepreneurs donate money. They need to pay taxes. And that's the bottom line. The second concept where I think we've surrendered much too much is the concept of peace. I mean, even well-meaning people, even well-meaning people, 
will look at something like Syria and they'll say the following sentence. We have to do something. We have to do something. You know, it's the old Lone Ranger joke. Lone Ranger and uh, Tonto are riding somewhere and a whole bunch of Native Americans surround them and Lone Ranger says, we're surrounded. And then Tonto says, who do you mean we, Kimo Sabe? <laughs> Who's we? We have to do something. I mean, have you lost your minds? Because when you say we have to do something, what you mean is the United States government has to bomb another country. That's what we have to do something concretely means. We have to do something doesn't mean let's bring refugees into the United States because the United States doesn't accept refugees. So let's not have utopianist, idealistic statements that masquerade for good feeling. We have to do something. Last summer, I spent several weeks traveling in the Sahel region of Africa from Mauritania to Chad. And you probably don't know that the United States is building the world's largest military base in Agadez. Now, this is amazing. Every time I travel to a country, I find that the United States is building the world's largest military base somewhere. I mean, it's like an internal competition in the US Defense Department. Is the world's largest base going to be in Pakistan? Will it be in Kabul? Is it going to be in Djibouti? No, now it's going to be in Agadez. Now, most people have never heard of Agadez. Agadez is the capital of Niger. Most people have never heard of Niger. Niger is in the Sahel region of Africa. Many people have not heard of Africa. It is a continent on the planet Earth. You might not know that the Europeans and the Americans have decided that Europe's border no longer should be at the Mediterranean Sea. That is to say at the northern end of the Mediterranean Sea. Europe's border has moved to the southern end of the Sahara. In other words, in the Sahel region. The French and the Americans have heavily militarized the Sahel and have built bases, fly drones and have special operatives stopping the movement of migrants north from West Africa and East Africa across the Sahara, very perilous journey across the Mediterranean into Europe. Now, why are people walking across this extraordinarily dangerous landscape, the Sahara, and why are they risking themselves on boats in the Mediterranean? Why are they trying to get to Europe? In 2003, in that same New York Times, two heads of government, the presidents of Mali and Burkina Faso wrote an op opinion piece. Now, of course, their opinion piece doesn't carry the same weight as the front page story that calls Nicolas Maduro a dictator. But nonetheless, the New York Times ran their opinion piece. And their opinion piece had a very strong headline. It said, your cotton subsidies are killing us. What these two men said, was that American cotton subsidies to American farmers were making it impossible for Burkinabe and Malian farmers to compete in a world of so-called free trade. This was in 2003. American subsidies to cotton farmers in America has killed farming in Burkina Faso and in Mali. Just as unfair trade policies driven by the West has destroyed West African agricultural production. Once you go to war against people, that is economic war against people, you have people march as refugees. You see refugees come out of Syria because that's a military war. But there has been an economic war against West Africa, against Central Africa and East Africa for at least the past 30 years. You might not know the name Thomas Sankara. But Thomas Sankara was the president of Burkina Faso, tried to put a different path before the African continent. And he was assassinated in May of 1987. He was assassinated, complicity of the French government. Because the West cannot tolerate an African leader who charts a separate path for Africa. It's not allowed. If you try it, you will get killed. Whether you are Patrice Lumumba in 1961, or Thomas Sankara in 1987. 
or Kwame Nkrumah, although he was overthrown in 1966. The problem you face here is in this battle of ideas, we've lost on the definition of what is wealth and we've lost on the definition of what is peace and what is war. The West has been at war with these countries for decades. The people who are trying to get out of very difficult situations in West Africa are now being blocked by another war. You might not know, but Al-Qaeda in the Maghreb is the largest cigarette smuggler in the Sahara. That's their main occupation. They are the biggest cigarette smugglers across the Sahara. But it's very convenient for the United States to say, we are at war against Al-Qaeda. We are there on a counter-terrorism mission. This is the battle of ideas being lost because we now believe in that ridiculous statement, we have to do something. If you want to do something, you have to fight against unfair trade policies that are making it impossible for people to survive in their homelands. If you truly want to do something, you have to fight against this massive military war machine which sells weapons around the, around the world and makes enormous profits for American companies. See, the real problem for the Green Party is that in some respects, to be truly American, you have to be anti-American. To be truly for the American people, you have to be against the American state. To be truly for working class American people, you have to be against these bourgeois parties that are suffocating the world on behalf of the United States of America. Thanks a lot.